welcome back to the Last Days Book Club. We're reading the book, I Will Die Free, by Noble Alexander with Kay Rizzo. It is the remarkable story dictated by the young Cuban pastor Noble Alexander of his life in a Cuban revolutionary prison where he was determined to fight to stay alive and to remain faithful to his Lord inside the very gates of hell. In our last reading, we covered chapter 4, where our Christian hero's torture was continued in a most terrifying way, being dunked in frigid lake waters so many times that he almost drowned and eventually lost consciousness, and being submitted to the infamous water torture where he had to stand on tiptoe in a cell in one position or face protruding nails in the floor which would pierce his heels while drops of water, one at a time, from which he could not escape, would drip, drip, drip on his head. This was a torture that had driven many to insanity. When they realized that he would not be broken, he was transferred to La Cabana, the death prison, where executions by firing squad was a daily occurrence. There he met a former soldier whom he had led to Christ, and they both rejoiced that God was with them despite their terrible circumstances, and they found peace in that awful place. We continue our reading today with chapter 5, entitled, New Life in La Cabana. A veil lifted from my memory as I studied the face of my brother in Christ. I remembered the abrasive officer he had once been, and the bottle of cognac he had offered me when I visited his office. I compared him to the new Antonio standing before me and marveled at the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, truly a two-edged sword. I have a plan, whispered Antonio. Generally, when a prisoner used this phrase, it was an escape plan. But my brother in Christ had something else in mind. Dear friend, he explained, it is my mission to share the gospel here in this prison. Will you help me? Amazed, I stared at him. Here? I asked, glancing about the cell. Where? The tunnel-like gallery resembled the inside of a huge oil tank or perhaps a submarine cut in half. The beds were stacked four high along each of the walls. A narrow corridor, the length of the cell, separated them. Right here, he gestured. Even as we spoke, we were surrounded by prisoners on every side. Some sat on the beds, some paced back and forth along the aisle, and still others stood nearby listening, since there was no place else to go. Antonio nodded and grinned. How do we begin? I asked. At the cross, at the cross, Antonio's rich baritone voice echoed off the walls. I immediately joined in. Our first underground church service had begun. Somehow, as we sang the familiar words, the burdens of my heart lifted, and as the song says, they rolled away. Before we finished the chorus, a third man, Predo Fernandez, joined us. Brother Alexander, Antonio began, will you read the morning text for us? Of course, I answered. I will be reading from the book of John, 
chapter 3 and verse 16. With a dignity worthy of the most prestigious congregation, I recited the well-known words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We prayed for our new mission, for our fellow prisoners, and for our captors. We prayed for strength and understanding. We prayed for guidance and for our own spiritual growth. By the end of our prayer, we felt the presence of a fourth man, three sinners and the Christ. We would carry out our ministry. We knew before we began that there would be many foes to fight. However, we knew we were being led by a general who had never lost a battle. One by one, other inmates joined our little circle of fellowship. Some joined out of boredom. Others joined in defiance of the communist regime and by hearing the word of God were changed. Before long, they nicknamed me the pastor. Some of the unbelieving prisoners hearing us pray for our captors became angry. How can you do that? These animals don't deserve your prayers, much less an answer from God. We tried to explain the love of God, but our explanations fell on deaf ears and hearts hardened by torture and abuse. We built a makeshift pulpit out of a cardboard box and a sheet. Our church within the dungeon walls was taking shape. A guard called M2 who as a child attended a Christian church with his aunt, smuggled a Bible into us. Satan saw the growing interest of many of the inmates and immediately set out to destroy it. First, a few of the more violent prisoners began referring to us as a cult, implying that our worship was questionable. Yet our numbers continued to grow. To accommodate the additional people, we moved our meetings to a larger open area in the center of our gallery. Enrico Vasquez, a nervous busybody type of man, thrived on deceit and violence. While we were careful to leave adequate space for the other prisoners to move about, he complained that we were in the way. Other malcontents such as Mario Simon and Jose Torreo joined him. The last thing we wanted to do was to create strife in the cell block. So we discussed our problem and decided to move two of our beds about and we would worship in the empty floor space. However, Satan wasn't about to surrender yet. At the beginning of our next meeting, we began to sing a hymn. We hadn't finished the first line when Enrico strode over to where we met. Hey, he said, I don't like all the noise your cult is making here. What a ridiculous claim. Night and day, the cell was constantly filled with the natural noise of so many people crammed in such a small living space. It was the hymn to which he objected. Like a banty rooster, Enrico strutted back to his cot. The worshippers gathered into a huddle. I could see that the old Antonio ached to get his hands on Enrico's neck, but instead the new Antonio pounded his fist into his hand. We've got to find a way to continue. We can't stop worshipping together. I know, Jesus Arango, one of the newer converts, said, I could never go back to the emptiness and isolation I felt before I joined the fellowship. We can change the hour of our service, meet at different times during the day instead of always at the same time, 
one of the worshippers suggested. We tried his suggestion, and it seemed to work for a time. Then around three o'clock one morning, the cell's overhead lights flashed on. The blinding lights and sound of rakisa, which means search and confiscate, along with the sound of metal striking metal and human flesh, created instant confusion for the startled prisoners. Sixty guards had tiptoed into the gallery and lined the length of the cell and were swinging two and a half foot lead pipes against the bed rails, the bed frames and the sleeping prisoners. The only means of escape from the terrible blows was through the one door that led to the courtyard. We ran from the cell like frightened deer trying to escape an attacking lion. To do that, we were forced to run between two guards who stabbed at us with a stick sharpened to a razor's edge while shouting, Get out! Get out! What do you have that pipe for, Corporal? Use it! The sergeant in command egged on the guard unit to inflict as much pain in as short a time as possible. The prisoners' mass exodus barred the exit, allowing the guards to beat us even longer. Once the last prisoner had broken free into the courtyard, another set of guards, specialists in ransacking, stealing, and sadism, arrived. The search that had begun in the wee hours of the morning continued throughout the day until 6 p.m. While the guard team searched the cell, our terror continued, for next to the courtyard was a rock quarry where dynamiting was going on. Shards and fragments of rock fell about us like shrapnel. With no place to run, we stood surrounded by pipe-armed guards exposed to the hot tropical sun without food, shelter, or water. Our discomfort dulled into numbness as the hours passed. In agony, we watched the search team throw out into the courtyard what meager possessions the prisoners might have acquired. Scraps of paper, worn out books, cigarettes in varying degrees of use, and spare clothing lay in a heap. Without glancing toward Antonio or the other brothers in the faith, my spirits sank. This time, our most treasured possession, our only Bible, had been added to the pile. A moment later, one of the guards lighted a match and set fire to our things. The sergeant ordered us to walk the gauntlet, a corridor between two rows of soldiers. The routine was always the same. At the beginning of the line, each prisoner was required to strip off his only garment, his underpants, and walk to the end of the line. The underwear was then inspected by the last guard in the line. When the guard was satisfied that there were no notes hidden in the seams, he tossed the underwear onto the ground and ordered the prisoner to bend over and pick up his clothing. With searchlight in hand, a lieutenant conducted the final search of the prisoner. By now, a large group of military women stood atop the walls around the courtyard, laughing and jeering at our humiliation. They herded us back into what was left of our cell to find the beds upside down, split open, and in total disarray. Water had spread all over the gallery floor after their check of the faucet. The prisoners looked about at the confusion, then at one another. We had no idea where to begin to restore order to the chaos. I was to learn that seldom a month went by without a requisa. I whirled about as a guard ran his iron pipe along the bars of the doors and shouted, Prepare for breakfast! Immediately, the starving prisoners fell into line. Before we could reach the mess hall, a guard ordered us into the supper line. While we waited to eat, we stood helplessly by, watching the flames devour our only earthly 
belongings. I long to break free and dash to the bonfire and rescue our Bible, but could not. I could only stand and watch and pray. Before long, our precious Bible was nothing but ashes. A fog of despair hung in the air as we silently made our way into the mess hall. When we returned to the cell, Antonio called us together. Come, brothers, it is time for our worship service. We need to realize God's presence more than ever before. Exhausted and sick of heart, we dropped to our knees. Immediately, we heard Antonio's usually strong baritone voice weakly sing the first few notes of what a friend we have in Jesus. Another voice, barely above the level of a whisper, joined him, and then another, until the ransacked cell rang with praises to our king. Suddenly the cell's clanging metal doors scraped open. A young soldier stepped inside our cell. A hush fell over the gallery as the entire prisoner population automatically melted back into the dungeon's shadows. They'd learned their lessons well. In order to survive, one must remain as inconspicuous as possible. Where is the minister who conducts the religious services? He asked. I was in trouble, and I would suffer for it. I knew it. Everyone in the dungeon knew it. The entire gallery population stared at the broken concrete floor without speaking. The soldier's gaze slowly roamed about the circle as if searching for his victim. Again he asked for the minister who had been conducting the religious services. I've come so far without denying my Lord, I reasoned. Now is not the time to start. I took a deep breath and stepped toward the waiting soldier. The soldier eyed me carefully and then asked, Are you the minister? Yes, I admitted, expecting at any moment a blow that would send me crashing to the floor. He withdrew two Bibles from inside his uniform jacket. I took these from the fire. Do you want them? Yes. Speechless, I stared in disbelief as he handed me the torn and partially destroyed Bibles. Thank you, I stammered. Remember, you don't know me, he ordered. With an abrupt click of his heels, he turned and left the cell. The cell door clanged shut. Stunned, I rushed to Antonio and handed him one of the Bibles. I don't believe it, I whispered. God has his people even among the enemy. Praise God, Antonio replied. Praise God. That was when we realized we had been foolish to make our possession of the Bible's public knowledge. We would protect the precious promises more carefully in the future. We learned to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Carefully, we divided the scriptures into a number of sections and hid the individual portions in various places in the gallery. My favorite hiding place for a portion of the scriptures was among one of the communist propaganda books we had been given to read. That way, when the guards conducted their next raid, at least one or two portions of scripture would remain secure. Like the early Christian believers facing the persecution of their times, we added to our numbers daily. Baptists, Seventh-day Adventists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Catholics, 
our fellowship recognized no boundaries. The walls of galleries 10, 11, and 12 echoed with praises to our faithful God and King. Prisoners, formerly disheartened and empty of hope, found comfort and joy as we sang. Though chained by hatred and deprivation, our pitiful group of Christian brothers declared themselves free in Christ. No walls could keep out the joy we found in that truth. Together we vowed that since we had been born free, we would die free. Our tormentors might destroy our bodies, but we would not allow them to destroy our souls. For this, those of us who knew the words sang the triumphant songs of praise. It was difficult for the new converts to join in since they didn't know the words to the hymns or to the Bible verses we shared. Antonio and I discussed the problem. If only we had enough Bibles for everyone, I mused. And hymnals, Antonio added, so everyone could sing along. What if we copied off each day's Bible texts for them to take with them, I suggested. Antonio tipped his head to one side. On what? We have no paper. Maybe, I smiled. An idea was forming. We do have paper. I picked up a scrap of a propaganda newspaper. We have the margins on which we could write portions of the scripture. We could use, I glanced around the cell, the inside of cigarette packs for writing out the words to the hymns. Eventually, news of our praise services spread beyond the prisoner population and our guards straight to headquarters. A satanic hatred filled the hearts of these brutal officials. Guards were ordered to break up the services by any means possible. But we could no more have stopped meeting together than we could have stopped eating our daily rations of wormy mush. Praise, in the face of persecution, provided a link with reality, with hope for a life beyond our daily existence. This link strengthened our determination to survive. One evening, as we sang the second verse of Demos Gracias al Señor, we give thanks to the Lord, a sniper from the opening in the gallery roof opened fire on us with his R2 Russian rifle. The prisoners who were not worshipping with us scattered for whatever cover they could find. A contingent of guards wielding billy clubs, chains, baseball bats, machetes and rifles surrounded the worshippers. Stop singing, their leader ordered. Stop this instant. We continued singing. They opened fire, shooting indiscriminately into our circle. Instead of scattering as the guards thought we would, we remained together, singing and praying as rifle bullet fragments and shrapnel embedded themselves in our flesh. The gunfire ceased, only to be followed by a beating massacre. A guard's machete blade pierced Luis Rodriguez's cheek. His teeth could be seen through the wound. A second guard pounded Magimbi, another brother with a rifle butt, destroying his eye. We struggled to escape the brutal blows of our captors. When the guards left the area, I noticed that the ring finger on my left hand was partly torn off. The excruciating pain didn't set in until at least an hour after the attack. Our guards offered no medical care. At the sight of such wanton brutality, I seethed with anger. My jaw tightened in steely silence. If only 
Like Peter at Gethsemane's gate, I thought for a moment, if only I could cut off their ears. Just let those Russian rifles fall into our hands. I didn't have long to plot vengeance, however. The injured brethren needed me. Not just my physical support, but also my spiritual. I snapped back to the reality of our plight. Obviously, the prison officials had no intention of supplying any medical attention for the wounded. My anger evaporated almost as quickly as it had arrived. Whispering promises for strength to one another from God's word, we bandaged and treated each other's trophies of honor as best as we could. In spite of our injuries, we praised God for being allowed to suffer for our Savior. By the time we had examined and treated the last prisoner's injury, my heart could once again sing. Two soldiers arrived at the cell and called Antonio's number. Headquarters wants to see you. Antonio stepped forward immediately. Me? What for? he asked. Who knows? I just follow orders, the officer in charge replied. You will come with us. Antonio obeyed. Since Antonio was a former military man and a very outgoing person, the authorities looked upon him as the leader of our little insurrection, so they took him first. Through the prison on the ground, word drifted back that he had been taken to the prison director's office. And like Paul, before Agrippa, Antonio spent the entire interview witnessing to the man. His words appeared to fall on deaf ears, for we also learned that Antonio had been sentenced to the dungeon for 21 days. At the end of three weeks, he was returned to the cell. When they returned him to the cell, the same guards called my number. I hastened to obey. With a guard marching on either side of me, their bayonets poised and ready for trouble, we crossed the courtyard and entered the main door leading to the prison offices. The nameplate on the director's office door read Captain Lemus. When the door opened, one guard flung me inside, followed and closed the door behind us. A large, broad-shouldered army officer in rumpled fatigues glanced up at me from behind the desk. Even before Captain Lemus rose to his feet, I could tell he stood way over six feet tall. Are you Alexander? he demanded. Yes, I replied. What are all you getting on with in there? I scowled for a moment. I don't understand your question. You will, he barked, reaching for his walking cane. Holding the base of the cane, he extended the cane and tried to wrap the hook about the back of my neck. I backed up to evade the hook, only to have the guard standing behind me push me forward. The commanding officer successfully hooked the cane about my neck and yanked my body forward like an ox or a horse's yoke would do. Making a quick move to the right, I ducked free of the hook. Captain Lemus slammed the cane down on the top of my head. I staggered from the stunning blow and felt something hot running down my forehead. I reached up and touched it. Dazed, I stared at the blood on my hand for an instant. That was my last conscious thought until the next day when I opened my eyes and found myself in the tiger's cage. Under our gallery and part of yard number two was a large basement, waist deep with rotten garbage and rats, insects, and various other unidentifiable creatures. Above the garbage hung a number of iron bar dungeons, or tiger cages as they were called. Each cage 
was made of three quarter inch steel bars. The cages were about five feet square. The darkness and the stench haunted my senses as I fought off the rats and lizards. My head ached from the concussion I had received the day before, and my body appeared to be one massive bruise from the iron bars on which I had lain. I moved about vainly trying to find a comfortable position in which to sit or sleep, and even momentarily relieve the pressure created by the iron bars pressing into the thin layer of skin stretched over my sharp angular bones. Any cushion of fat I might have had before my arrest had long since melted away. To take my mind off my discomfort, I thought of Iraida and my little son. I wondered what she had told him about me. Would he even remember me when I returned home? If I returned home? I struggled to recall every detail of my earlier life. I disappeared when some of my memories refused to surface, and I grew frightened when I couldn't recall the faces of various friends and relatives. Life in the tiger cage took on a bizarre routine. I learned how to tell when the guard was near. A dim light filtered down from the prison yard above me through the hole where the garbage was dumped. While I couldn't make out the man's features, I could occasionally see his silhouette during the daytime. At night, from the depth of our putrefied tomb, the prisoners in the other cages tapped out messages in a code they had worked out. Using anything at hand, a spoon, a stone, a brick, we scraped out the dashes and tapped out the dots on the iron bars of our cages. This nightly communication kept me alive, supplying me with the will to live. Every few days when he remembered, the guard would toss me a bowl of mush. On his day off, the guard would purposely forget to inform his replacement of my presence, and I would go both without food and water until he returned the following morning. At the end of my 21-day sentence, the guards lifted me out of my smelly hole and returned me to the gallery. Shocked, I entered my cell to a hero's welcome. My incarceration in the dungeon had proved to be a blessing straight from the throne of God. Because Antonio and I had defied the authorities and survived, the other prisoners considered us to be heroes. Every prison contains prisoners who don't really fit into any definite category such as political or criminal. Our Christian group referred to this loosely constructed group of men as Moses' mixed multitude. Due to our hero status, many of these men joined our ranks. While earlier they had often violently disagreed with us in our ministry, we now united against a common enemy, the communists. Side by side, we proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone who would listen. The Holy Spirit blessed our words. An interest in Christ and his love spread throughout the prison at a record rate. God had confounded our captors. In the face of such a victory, my wounds didn't seem so severe or my bruises as painful. Surrounded by such devastating madness, such wanton cruelty, I could finally see a purpose to my continued existence. God didn't want me to give up and die. He had chosen 
to use Antonio and me the same way he used the witness of his people throughout all time. By remaining faithful, our spilled blood would become the living seed of truth to men who had long since lost all belief in life or truth. The end of chapter 5 of I Will Die Free by Noble Alexander.